The Ensemble podcast is intended for professional financial advisors. All discussion is limited to publicly available information and should not be interpreted as legal, professional or financial advice. Ensemble does not hold an AFS license nor provide any financial services. Before making investment decisions, you should obtain financial advice from a qualified financial advisor. Hey guys, it's Ben Nash here. I'm one of the co-founders at Ensemble and founder of financial advice company Pivot Wealth, which is my business baby I started from scratch a little bit over seven years ago. In that time, I've leveraged some of the learnings of the Ensemble community to scale the business to become one of the better known financial advice companies for high income accumulators in Australia. And through this podcast, you can join me each Tuesday as I have the absolute privilege of interviewing some amazing people where I'm going to selfishly be able to learn and continue my journey to improve every area of my advice business. Hopefully you can learn a few things on that journey as well. Jump over to Ensemble.com and if you haven't already signed up to learn and share from others or simply download the app. This podcast series is brought to you by leading Australian life insurer, TAL. TAL is committed to partnering with advisors to protect the financial well-being of their clients now and into the future. TAL's accelerated protection products ensure your clients have access to cover options that are suited to their individual needs. Last financial year, TAL paid $2.7 billion in claims to nearly 40,000 customers. Hey guys, welcome back to the Ensemble podcast. And uh, today I'm here with James Whelan. James is an investment manager at VFS Group, rather. and uh, pretty timely that we're chatting uh, at the time of this recording. The we're four or five days into the Silicon Bank, Valley Bank uh, collapse and the uh, the flow through into markets. Uh, James, good to be chatting, mate. How are you now, Ben? It's great to talk. And and don't worry about getting the name wrong, mate. It's been v- VHS a few times. It's uh, I didn't come up with the name as the thing. <laughs> the uh, the guys that came up with them. It used to be called Vertical yeah. Financial Solutions, and then they shortened that to VFS Group. And so I go on I go on Ausbiz and I go on anyone's show. Bloomberg VHS. So we got James Whelan from VHS Group. He's going to come and tell us all about equities, man. And it's uh, yeah, mate. It's 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 fine. It happens. It happens to the best of us. I get they think that I'm thinking with that one, but uh, anyway, here we are, mates. Uh, look, I thought a good place to start is if you could. You had a bit of an interesting background. Just tell us it. Talk us through how you've ended up where you are today. Okay. Uh, well. <laughs> Uh, one of the things that I don't I don't really enjoy talking about is is talking about myself, but I'll do it just for the uh, just for the sake of it. But I do love talking, so that's okay. Uh, so Ben, I I cracked in. Um, I got my start in the industry working in the surveillance department of the ASX back when they were uh, a, a you know part of the uh, the governance of the of the market as before it went over to the ASIC side. Uh, and so if that learnt, you know from there you learn. The ropes on how the markets move, how what people are watching, the way you know things that you probably should do and do not want to do in uh, in equities and in options. No doubt. Uh, sorry. No doubt. Yeah. No, abs- yeah. 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 It's 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 always good to see what sets off red lights and what doesn't set off red lights. Pissing off the regulator is absolutely something that everyone should try and avoid doing, and that's a great way to learn how to do it. Uh, from there, got to start as a desk <laughs> assistant, assistant, assistant at a little place called Ozstock, which is sort of where I learned uh, a little bit about a- advising. Um, amazingly, the switch from Ozstock to when I uh, when I went to UBS came when a senior advisor turned to me and asked me, he said, "James, can you figure out what I think it wasn't mortgage-backed securities? It was it was the the the, the debt, the collateralized debt obligations, or something like that. That the stuff that was packaged up and just absolute garbage." He asked and turned to me and said, "Can you figure out what all this is about?" And that was sort of the prelude. I looked at him and just went, "Well, this is this is a calamity. I, I didn't know how big a calamity it was actually going to be." Um, it was garbage. Went to UBS, learned how to do a back office. The best piece of advice I got from from a senior advisor at Ozstock was learn how an actual shop runs and every single intricacy and every detail of that. Um, get into it. There, there are people, the worst advisors are just guys who sit at the front. They know how to pick up the phone and they know how to do everything. But if you couldn't service everything to do with a client at the post sale, then you weren't going to survive. I learned that the, at UBS, the way that UBS was moving, and this is with their investment banking team. I learned that with them just saying, if you don't know every single thing about how all of this stuff at the back works, A, the people at the back will not be nice to you, and then it'll make your life a lot harder, and also the people at that you're dealing with on the on the sales side, uh, sales side so the, the buy side, 
if you don't uh, if you can't answer their questions about why something hasn't sailed or why some hedging wasn't done right, how the PB wasn't working, the prime broker wasn't working properly, or anything like that, if you couldn't answer those questions, they don't want to know you either. So it really became a, 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 a situation where, yeah, you've got to know how the how the entire situation worked. From UBS, I saw an opportunity come up because remember, Tricom uh, Tricom failed uh, failed to settle to the market two days straight here in the in Australia. And the opportunity, the reason was because the collateral that uh, the brokers had to have up on the market. When was this? This is actually GFC related too. So this is about two thousand and nine. Uh, the reason uh, the, the the collateral that brokers had to have up on the market was like fifty thousand or a hundred thousand dollars. It was nothing For, compared to millions and millions and millions of dollars worth of settlements that they owed to the market. You, the collateral that you had up was uh, was was nothing. Minuscule. So we saw an opportunity there. Uh, I had a, a, a friend of mine that I had sort of worked for with. His name was Craig Mason, amazingly. Everyone knows him. Um, he was starting up a little operation that was going to take care of that collateral on behalf of brokers for a, a, a variable fee. And I saw that as being the future of broking. We set up. I was third person through the door um, at this little startup. It was just three or four of us when we kicked it off in 2009. Uh, and it also coincided with the announcement that my wife was three months pregnant with my first daughter, and so I'm not going to work these 14 or 16 hour days at UBS, which was a great shop. It just wasn't lifestyle friendly. Um, I'm going to go to the startup and 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 do something that's a bit more empowering that gives me a bit more time. We started Penson. Penson got bought out by BNY Mellon, which became Pershing, and Pershing, by the time we built it, was uh, clearing for about a third of the market, uh, which was great, a huge opportunity. Ford Minette uh, doing what they uh, doing what they were doing with us, Wilson's. Uh, uh, think about sure stockbroking. All of the the big names came through us, and uh, and they, and they cleared through us. So I built that. I built the disaster recovery plan for it, the BCP from scratch. The, these are significant achievements of mine, which I don't really like to. I, I don't talk about enough. I think. Um, but the, this the so we built that. Um, built the connectivity through it, and that's sort of the, the, the connectivity training that I'd learned at UBS. Really ga- gave me a huge advantage at Pershing of just going, okay, I can connect your iris screen to a GBST shares terminal. Um, and then from there, have the post trade reporting that then comes back into your platform as well, and learn how to connect all of these things up together. Pershing, um, I went to Comsec Advisor Services to sell margin lending services and cash accounts to the, the people that I already knew from Pershing. So sort of just a, a, a way of getting into the big bank. Big bank had a bit of a reshuffle, changing what they were doing at, uh, in the Comsec side. Um, got a big fat redundancy check at the same time as BBY collapsed. I had a friend of mine that I uh, that I've been working with at Pershing who was messaging me every 20 minutes just saying, James, we've bought or we're about to buy the shell of BBY, which has absolutely gone under. Nobody knows where their money is. Nobody knows what's going on here. We've got advisors that are just walking in and out of the place. Someone's jimmied the door open and it's just propped open. And so I took my box straight up from Comsec up to BBY on a contracting high, classic hired gun sort of scenario. You walk in and there's just stuff everywhere. And it's like, there's advisors that are sleeping on the floor. Someone had someone had managed to get into the to the to the locks. There was two padlocks on the wine fridge. Um, they managed to get in and steal all the good stuff, which I was really waiting to get my hands on. First thing I did, so I was just going, you know, well, I'm head of strategic ops. I gave myself a title. Any any set of keys in the entire place, just grab all these keys, change it, get BBY started up. So we managed to turn that into a functioning broker called APP Securities, um, and uh, the, my job was done there. From there, I moved over to some friends of mine that, that, that I actually, ironically, I helped set up their first advisor codes when they first uh, cracked into the market when I was at UBS, so full circle. And so some people that I'd known for a fair chunk of my life had a little thing called VFS Group, which is where I am now. So I took the book that I'd built up as being the operations manager or the, 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 just the guy who was on the phone calling clients saying, I'm going to help you. I'm going to protect, to protect your money. I'm going to show you how to get this out from the ASX and I'm going to show you how to get control of your super fund and your stocks and anything that you've got, I'm going to help you do that. The clients that I had helped were really happy to move with me over here to VFS. And from there, I've been doing this advisory thing and, and kicking it off. We started a, uh, we sort of took the, the managed discretionary account side of things, which uh, which the VFS group had on their license, but were underutilizing, I think. And so we managed to take that, clean it up and really launch it and just go, you know what, we can go overseas with what we can do and we can go overseas really, really well and we can we can do this quite well because we have the technology and the knowledge to do that. But to do that, you've got to do it on a discretionary basis. You can't be calling clients at three o'clock in the morning saying there's an opportunity to go long banks 
because there's a GFC version two in the midst right now. You've got to be able to do it on discretionary. So we've taken that our managed discretionary service and 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 really ramped that up um, colossally. Clients are much happier at not being continually bothered with this sort of stuff, but they are very happy to have you know continual portfolio reporting and the access that they have. So we sort of have this global shift, which which we call loosely the global macro fund, which is sort of what I what I manage, um, and, and that's a, just a loose way of just saying it's just managed discretionary accounts. We invest, you know, I, I invest mostly overseas ETFs for the most part, some single names that are in there as well. But it's just my ability to just go in and out of these big thematic shifts, which we'll get to in a second, Ben, um, that I do, and that's sort of what I that, that's sort of what I do now, and that affords me the the, the chance to to do this. We do a lot more of the the media stuff and talking to people like you, and and we sort of took that. That's been my main job that I've done here, and I think that we've had we've had a pretty good run of it. So VFS Group do sort of the, the full range of financial planning, but your role is specifically around the the investment management. You know, given the background that that you've just unpacked for us, and interesting, as I said at the start, like interesting that we're talking now, given that this SVB banking collapse has has just kicked off and is in essentially full full swing. Um, you know, massive spikes in in VIX and uh, you know, choppy markets. What are you seeing out there at the moment? Uh, I'm seeing I'm seeing a lot of opportunity out there in the moment, but the the ability for everyone to panic has never changed. Sort of, I I, I was thinking before, and especially over the weekend, about sort of you know you, you get to your early forties and you start to consider your career like you're an old man in this industry. But the I go back to my time at during the GFC and we were and this going back to the UBS times then and thinking I I can now remember what happened during that GFC and we were booking out 10% of the market every day 14 16 hour days just absolute you know just a calamity and seeing the markets absolutely devastated and then going down to the to the trading floor talking to the talking to the guys that are actually on the coal face making the decisions down there and some of them just just going James these are generational buying opportunities that you're seeing down here and some of these things and just being calm as cucumbers, not panicking. Like you, you go up in the ops department and everyone's going, oh my God, it's off 8%. Everything's all going, it's good. You're going to hell in a handbasket. We're all going to die. You know, look at all this money that's sort of being lost. And then the guys down on the trading floor who had, who'd seen these sort of things before going, you know what, this is cool. I can see this happening. I'm picking up this research and just being very, very calm and going, you know what, today's the day that we buy or tomorrow's the day. To, and, and, and just picking up some of these things. I'm seeing that same sort of thing that's going on. However, what we've seen, Ben, just talking generally, sort of, you know, broadly about the market um, uh, uh, as a whole. What we're seeing, though, is that when the GFC was happening back then, the time for, for information and the information curve, whatever you want to call it, was really sort of quite wide. So the difference between someone knowing something and then someone else knowing something was was huge. Um, you know, the, the, you'd have the guys down on the trading floor just going, I've got this particular thing that's sort of just come up on my screens. No one else would know about that for a very long time. And, and definitely the people that were on the outside of the market. Now, you got your tweet feed. Every single operator has got their tweet deck sitting up there, which is with a live. Someone actually told me that they have me on their tweet deck. I don't know why, but going, <laughs> this is where my information comes from. And this is people who are telling me what's going on. And I get this live. So your Bloomberg screen is important, obviously, as well. But your tweet feed, and that coming in with that live information, we saw that in 2016, we saw how quickly information comes in. Brexit happens, and you're just like, great. In two days' time, I'm going to buy. Trump got this is Trump got elected, and the market absolutely pooped its pants, and it was just like wow. And it's just like, yep, you know what? Tomorrow I'm going to be able to just roll in, calm as a cucumber, and just buy the crap out of this thing, and it's going to be sensational. And you didn't even get that chance. It rallied a few hours later. Brexit, similar sort of thing. You just went. There were opportunities to get it, but you had to be so much quicker. The same thing is happening with with this right now. So Ben, I mean, over the weekend, I'm just like, oh, this is going to be sensational. Everyone is going to, and even I haven't learned. I, you know, I don't learn anything, mate. I, I, I completely refuse to. But I'm, th- I'm sitting there on Sunday, just going, this is going to be sensational. I've got a whole bunch of fat dividends that are going to rolling in, hitting accounts right now. I'm going to be looking at, at, at charging in some of this stuff and just going, I'm going to buy some of these banks, some of these US banks at generational lows. It's going to be absolutely pristine. I've got the whole thing planned out later in the week. It's just going to be wonderful. It turns out that, well, the way that it looks. You had to be really quick on the button on Monday night, and and, and you don't get that secondary chance because because the thing is not only has information really started to, to catch up with how fast you know every everyone knows everything all at once now that's a that's a that's a kicker that we're seeing the differences between these two things but also that the remedies to these things are so much quicker to be enacted whereas before the GFC 
you had Bernanke, he was talking about maybe I was going to do something. He's going to go in front of the Senate inquiry, talking about how much money he could print. And then everyone's saying, oh, what are they going to do? And, and, and it was just this long drawn out, okay, we might have a solution about what it is that we're going to do. And there's going to be a tarp and we're going to prop things up and it's going to be okay. And now it's just like, yeah, we just had a meeting and everything's fine. It's just like, oh, well, that's that really ruins my idea that I have of actually being able to go and have a you know have 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 a beer have a beer on Sunday. You've got to be really quick on the on the button on Monday, otherwise you miss out. And it just shows you just got to you just got to be faster. You've got to have your things set because the markets are so super efficient. What I'm seeing out there in the market now, in answer to it, I still see that there's value um, in the bigger end of town in the banks. I think that if the Fed aren't going to be raising rates as aggressively now, I think that tech. Which has always been some great value with all of its massive amounts of free cash flow. Uh, tech is 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 a spot that you want to be having a look at as well. Um, just based on that simple, it came off when the Fed was aggressively raising, and now if they're not aggressively raising, the 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 other side of that coin now flips over. So there's some value that's in that. Still some value in tech in the big banking side as well. And if you've got a USD, if you've got a US dollar that we may may potentially keep on coming off, then that's going to be assisting uh, the commodities side. Um, China is still very much a big growth engine, but that's a, that's a whole different conversation. Yeah, it's interesting. I think that like doing nothing is always risky, but I feel like at the moment it's it's more risky than ever before. And I think like we're having conversations with clients day in and day out, uh, and they hear all the noise and and get swept up in all of the fear, and they're going, "Oh yeah, probably I'm going to play it safe, and you know I'll just stick." The money in the in the offset account, or um, you know, p- park it away in cash, and it, it feels like a comfortable thing to do. But I don't know. Like in my view, it's like you only get so many of these golden periods as an investor that you can use to serious wealth building. And it's like you know, people that have the right support, the right plan, that as you say, are, are ready to rock. They're the ones that can take full advantage. Whereas the other ones are then scrambling and they're left behind, miss the boat. And I was looking at uh, some really interesting stats that came out from there's actually from perla the the micro investing or etf investing platform whatever and they talked about if you put 10k into the s p 530 years ago that it'd be worth about two hundred eight thousand dollars today but if you'd miss the 25 best days in markets best days period, yep your 10 grand would be yep. worth thirty six thousand. so you're like a hundred and seventy thousand dollars worse off from yeah i love that line. stat yeah i love that stat. Stat. and there and the, yeah, and th- 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 there are these there are these seagulls. I call seagulls seagulls. These seagulls on Twitter who are like, yeah, but if you know, you got to just pick those days that you did, that you're going to have pick it in and out. It's just like, mate, I've already got a job. My job, most <laughs> most people, most people also already have a job. They're not picking those days, mate. They're not they're not being able to pick those days of in and out. Stay in, stay invested. I will tell you what I have done actually, Ben, and this is this is cool. You like this? So last year, I don't know if you saw that the stat that was being thrown around a bit, which was. Um, it was just based on simple, just the VIX, right? So the volatility index. If the vol- it, and, and it was a simple sort of back test for what happened in 2022. If you had just simply buying and selling the S&P 500, not that people should do this, but this is just a simple example. Buying and selling the S&P 500. If you sell when the VIX goes below 20 and you buy when it goes above 30, you would have outperformed. Uh, like you, I, I can't remember how much it was, but, but the performance was sensational. Right, not even our performance. You're actually genuine alpha. You would have made a lot of money. Uh, that I've carried that into 2023, thinking 2023 is going to be sort of similar to the way that we saw 22. The news, inflation up, markets come off, Fed's going to be raising, and then oh, okay, it's actually not that bad. Markets, you know, maybe the Fed's going to ease back a bit. Markets going to go up, and just that ebbs and flows that we're going to have. And I'm tra- and just on the VIX. So if you just want to go, okay, when should I be overweight and when should I be underweight? So you still you're still invested. Just go and have a look at the VIX because you can see it hit 30 the other night and that was a great time to buy. And when again, when it was dwindling around at 20, that's probably a good time to maybe sell. If you just want to have that really easy how much you want to be in, overweight or underweight the market, but still stay invested, try and have a look at the, at, at the volatility index over in the States. It's not that difficult to look up. Anyone can do it. So, but, but, but that's one that I'm looking at just going, you know what? It was dwindling around 20 for a while there. Maybe I just want to ease back on some of this stuff and then... <laughs> Especially if you see that the two, the two, if the front end of the yield curve over in the states is showing you a five percent number, you definitely want to have a look at, uh, at getting a bit invested in that as well. Going long bonds at that front end of the curve was uh, was a really smart move as well. Now starting to switch that out and moving that into equities and just having that, so staying invested, but definitely using that sixty forty portfolio just with how you're going to be over and under invested is uh, it's probably the best way to look at twenty twenty three. 
Yeah, it's an interesting one. I, I feel like at the moment that there's a lot of money that's sitting on the sidelines and all these people panic with, you know, fear and all the noise that's out there. But it seems like as soon as, and, and there's a lot of like disastrous predictions floating around as well, which is contributing to that, uh, to that feeling. But I feel like whenever we get mm. some positive news or positive signs or something's not as bad as these dire predictions that everyone's sort of throwing around, then it's like it rallies and rallies quickly. So yeah, it's an it's an interesting time that, as an advisor and for investors as well. Like I get the fear, but it's hard. You sort of just want to shake people sometimes and go like, don't listen to the lunatics on Twitter or TikTok or, uh, you know, those clicky headlines. They're um, yeah, because they're really they're really not not serving you. Um, yeah, that's and I've, you, I've, I've spoken to go. I was just going to say, how do you see it playing out, sort of from from here? How do, I, how do I see it playing? I was going to talk about the hack journalists on Twitter and the way that they probably just need to be very careful with what it is that they say and how they say it because the panic that they cause is actually not is actually not good. And it comes back and, it, and I get a call from someone saying, just like one of my clients saying, James, I just saw this guy, he's an ABC journalist on Twitter and he says the Credit Suisse is going to go under very soon. It's just like, well, it's not. Um, <laughs> so take it easy. And I know it's not because I actually know what I'm talking about. Uh, so... This person, the, 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 there's a lot of those financial hacks that are out there. And I've I, one of the legacies that I want to have, so when I started here at VFS, I, I, a friend of mine, Paul Colgan, was running Business Insider. And he was the editor here in Business Insider. And, I, and he and I talked, we've known each other for a long time. It was just like, we need to make the way that people receive their information better. And we need to make it, I hate to use the word democratize, but we need to, just need to make it more accessible. Because it's got this sort of view, especially with the way that, that so many retail the, the, the retail client has basically been screwed over so much recently by regulations and how they until recently has been screwed over by the regulations of not being able to get the advice that they want because physically it is actually too difficult to deliver them the, the advice that they need um, in a nice concise format and also a lot of the space is moving away from retail advisors because the risk is just too high um, you know a, a complaint will usually fall in the client's favor regardless of who's to blame or not We've seen the Royal Commission's all, all dragging everyone through the mud once again. People just want to stay away from that sort of stuff and to stay away from the retail space. So we need to make the way that people get their information as accessible and as simple as possible. My legacy to the industry, if I have one, is going to be A, drink all the beer, and B, I want to, <laughs> I, I, I want to be known as the guy that could take a very complex uh, financial theory or a complex financial scenario and being able to put it into something that actually makes sense that people can actually understand. And that's that, that's been my sort of my legacy of just going, you know what, there was a time that people didn't understand how the yield curve worked. There were time there was a time when I didn't understand how how bond prices, you know, bond prices move up. I believe Martin Wetton, a good friend of mine, is is head of fixed income and FX over at Commonwealth Bank. Um, you know, he's he's very happy to always always comment and mention that yes, bond prices do go up and yields go down. And, and they move inversely to each other. That's, that's something that people didn't really always know until all of a sudden bond prices started started to matter when everything sort of went started to go to zero. But uh, that, that just taking those complex things and being able to put them into packages for people to actually understand and go, okay, this is now how this affects my portfolio. This is how it affects my actual super fund. As opposed to, I trust this smart guy who I don't know is actually screwing me over or not, and you don't know how what's going on. You can still have some control over your, over your portfolio. That way, it's control over your life if you could actually understand what the hell's going on out there. I think that we're doing a good job of doing that. Now, what was your question? Sorry? Uh, what do I, what how do I see like, it playing out? Yeah. Um, Particularly, yeah. In the, I suppose, like looking at the, the situation in the US, uh, you know, how far they might have to push it, the fact that inflation just seems so stubborn and, and not coming down. And, and there is, obviously, there's a lot of noise out there and a lot of opinions as well as to, you know, how long the, the high interest rates might, uh, might be with us for. And obviously, yeah, that that playing through to investors. So, what's your take from from seeing it at the coalface? I think I think that if you talk about what Powell what Powell has said in the past, and I was reminded, especially over the weekend and and on Monday night, sorry, Monday morning with the fixes that they that, that they put in. Don't forget, there was a couple of months ago when Powell sort of did this thing, and, and once again, financial journalism, the press got up, everyone, and just said, "Look, it, the pivot's coming, the pivot's coming, the pivot's coming." It was way early for a pivot call. It was the market was setting itself up to fall. And because and then Powell came out and he gave a speech that was very hard about we are going to keep on powering on and we're going to go higher for longer. And I will not forget someone sort of paraphrased exactly what he said, where he said it is easier for me to 
fix something that we break by doing this than it is for us to continue to perpetuate this low rate cycle nonsense. And that's that 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 is stuck with me. You should put it put it on a piece of paper, laminate it, put it up on your wall because he's going harder for longer for as hard as he wants to do. Until don't forget until something breaks because we just saw something break. This the the banking system. There were banks that are actually broken. That they, they they had these held to maturity. They've got held to maturity bonds um, that have actually plummeted. So the valuation has gone, and they've got about what well, they're, they're receiving about one and a half, maybe two percent tops in interest. And then you've got clients clients of the of the of the bank that were expecting why aren't I receiving four or five percent? Okay, I'm going to move my money over here in four or five percent because you're only paying me two percent on that. And and that that that's a that is something that's broken. Could they fix it? Easy. They did. It's fixed. And see how quickly they fixed it and easy it was. Don't forget that Powell is going to do that. So it was easy for him to fix it. So yeah, they can keep on keeping on and keeping on doing what they need to do in the face of inflation. So I will stand by this view. As long as inflation is staying where it is staying and going where it is going, they will keep doing what they need to do to stop that. And they can mm. fix things that break instead of perpetuating the low rates. See, with, mm. see where I'm at? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, totally. And I th- think that that's what some, and I suppose you could see right right or wrong, but as investors, it's one of the things that, that we're talking about, that it's we know that the regulators step in when, like you say, when, when something breaks, that uh, the property market starts break. Like you look back at the, the, the stats in Australia, we do a lot of strategic advice around property and it's like any time that, that things start to, to fall down, the, the RBA step in, the banks step in, the regulators step in, the same in, mm. in markets as well and I, I think that is you know like i said rightly or wrongly like a, a bit of a parachute for for investors that the governments and the central banks do not want there to be massive fallout and if that happens they're going to step in to, to to do that so yeah it's uh, here's where here's where i am i'm going to ask you ben and uh, if i may now become the interviewer because i have my own podcast so i know how to ask a question or two when i need to where do you stand on the bailout question? And a lot of people, this has brought up this sort of this whole moral hazard BS that everyone wants to talk about. Do you think that investors, if there is if there is a crisis that hits something, because I mean, let's be honest, if you run your if you're running a bank and you run your risk badly, do you think that you should be bailed out for for that erroneous situation that you put yourself and your investors in? Or who should be bailed out? Also, is another question. Well, look at the core. I'd say that from a from a principles perspective, you'd say no. And I consider myself a, a free market capitalist, so I'd say let the market decide. I, I suppose though that the issue as an investor, I'm like I'm I'm happy when shit doesn't explode because then then you know <laughs> down, the outside is limited, and then upside is swift and and strong. So. Uh, I, and I think that this is the you know the the world that we live in political cycle, uh, media cycle. Like it's uh, no one wants to deal with the pain of a long term extended you know downturn depression. Dealing with the fallout and the easier solution is that people step in, regulators step in, uh, central banks step in, and you know they do something to fix things and fix things faster. But I I am concerned with that that the you know how long can that go on for and will it get to a point where they say well actually it's just too much and now we mm. need to let's break but now because so many things are breaking that it's going to be worse and bigger and more so yeah it that, is it is gonna, it, it, yeah it's it, it's sort of the, I, i'm very much of the view that that individuals should be protected from from scoundrels and 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 loose you know loose risk policy that they have. So, if you're an individual deposit holder at a bank that 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 mismanaged their risk, then yeah, you should probably be insured for that, um, and you should probably you know make sure that your money is safe because because trust in the banking system is imperative to an actual free market working and an actual you know civilization actually sustaining itself. We don't need roads; we need banks. The I can't believe I just said that. Someone's gonna someone's gonna crucify me for that. But anyway, sorry. Um, but the uh, so on on that regard, so depositors, however. I'm reminded 2019, Barry Ritholtz from Ritholtz Wealth did a, a, an episode of Macro Voices, which is a great podcast. I mean, plugging other podcasts. Anyone who wants to learn a bit more about the way that big picture stuff works in the world, Macro Voices is a good podcast. And he was on there. And I remember him talking, it stuck with me so strongly. It's just like, this isn't capitalism that we've got. If you know a guy down at, down at the Fed that 
you're running a bank and you could say, you know what, we can do whatever we want because I've got a guy who's down there who's going to be able to bail me out. You know what? No, it shouldn't work that way. If you can't manage your risk, then you take your ass down. It's a big, big fancy building. It's got big columns downtown New York. It's called bankruptcy court. You go and you do bankruptcy and you go through it the right way, the way that it should. Because if you don't take the risk and if you don't know that you're on the risk and taking the risk, then you don't care about your, your own risk, right? If there is no risk, then why should you get the reward? And why should you only get the rewards if everything goes well, but not carry any of the risk if things go badly? Stuck with me mm. so strongly. Uh, that was that because we don't have capitalism right now. It's a it's a form of crony capitalism that that mm. is just the way of just creeping in and just saying, you know what, the investors they that they need to be bailed out too, not just the depositors. I'm just like, you know what, pump the brakes on that. And I think the same thing about property as well. And this is something that's probably going to be the, eventually everyone is saying about just how much it's going to break. Maybe in, I don't know where it's going to break. Everyone says Australia. I think everyone needs to calm down there. But somewhere it's going to break. The property market, okay? The property market's going to teeter over and investors are going to lose their money. You know, you and I both know that there's going to be front page of the Fin, front page of the Telegraph, front page of the Age going, look, these, these property investors, these noble landlords, these people out there doing God's work, investing for people and giving people a place to live, they need our help too, and they do. And you know what? F you, man, because if you if you make an investment and it goes badly, that's on you. I don't care what you want to say about that, because if one of if if I make an investment on behalf of a client and it goes badly, I don't get to be on the front page of the Telegraph and say BHP dropped twenty percent. That doesn't work that way. Investment properties is the same way and should be treated the same way as well. I mean, COVID was a bit of an exception because the government actually forced everyone to shut down. So I mean, that's a, that's a bit of a situation there. But if if a, if a whole bunch of property hits the wall, if you've got was Steve, I think it was, his name was Steve, was in the paper yesterday. Steve's got twelve investment properties and they're all in debt and he's in a real situation. Well, Steve, I don't know how to tell you this, mate. You're stuffed, so you need to sort that out and you need to pull back because this is the part of the economy that needs to start retracting. These are those things that everything needs to start coming backwards. Otherwise, we're not going to get a lid on the inflation situation. Anyway, yeah, that, that, that's me. That's me soapboxing, mate. I agree with the sentiment and and. Uh... Yeah, I, I think that there there are a number of property investors out there that are hurting at the moment. Um, but the reality is that they they went into it looking to make money and did it without the appropriate risk management uh, in, in place. And I think there are a few of those stories that that happened during COVID, and it was it was slightly different as well. But also with the some of the boom cycles, and we saw like the mining boom for properties, and then you had these property investors that were buying up. All of these multiple properties in these mining towns, and then in WA, that's right, yeah, yeah, mining town, and then they're going, oh, poor me, and I, like I think you went in there hoping for significant upside returns. It's like that sort of is the game. So, uh, yeah, exactly. uh, you, you you can't. I'll, I'll put it that you can't privatize the reward, but socialize the 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 risk. Mm. Do you sort of see where I'm saying that? So if, if you privatize the profits and socialize the losses, it doesn't work that way. It shouldn't work that way. And we've really moved in that direction, which is which is which is annoying and it's upsetting that's there. And anyone and the people that I've had on my podcast, I've had senior economists, junior economists, people who just pick pick up the garbage. Anyone with half a brain knows that Phil Lowe did not specifically say I won't raise rates. He put caveats on that about inflation. He put caveats on that about the whole thing. Also, don't forget there was an election going on. We don't talk about that either. And I think that he was told what to do, but that's a different scandal that we've got going on. I'm not going to go into that too bad bit. He didn't. He didn't say he wasn't going to. No one went and put a gun to your head and said, you know what, Phil. Phil says that he's not going to raise rates, so you're okay to buy that 1.4 million dollar place in Botany. Good luck to you, mate. It's going to be fantastic. <laughs> you can absolutely guarantee that you're going to make money on this thing. Don't, hey, here's another one, Ben. Real estate agents. Real estate. Okay. I. <laughs> whilst we're here, <laughs> I'm going to say something crazy. I'm going to get myself sued. The uh, what we've got is, you know, I've got to do 50, 60 hours of, of continuing personal development, professional development to be able to maintain my authorized representation uh, uh, certification so that I can be an advisor. Oh. And also I'm a responsible manager too, right? So we've we've got that. In real estate, What what I think it's about five or six hours that they have to do is clicking a few buttons and that's about it. They're advising, mm. and, it, and they are, and I've heard them say it, they're giving personalized advice to retail investors to retail people on the biggest transaction of their life, the biggest transaction of their life. And they're saying, you yes. know what, if you buy there, you're going to do well. That's a guaranteed outcome. And you, you've seen these guys, these real estate 
cowboys that are there that will say this sort of thing and just go, you know, we've looked at your personal situation and it looks like that you can actually afford this. It's all retail. It's all personal advice. And they're doing that on the biggest transaction of their life. Mm-hmm. And we are the ones that get the cop that, that, that have to cop the regulatory changes. We're the ones that have to cop a, a, an actual functioning complaint system. We're the ones that have all of the downside and all of the risk because we're out there on the wire protecting people from the sharks out there and trying to keep their super funds safe. Whereas real estate agents get scot-free and do whatever they want and take a much bigger rip than we do. Don't worry about that. And to, to be able to advise people and have absolutely do, do this downside scot-free. What like the, mm. the, this, the system is the broken. broken. That's the side that needs to be fixed. The broken side is, is broadly the same, although they are making steps in the right direction on that side, but massive decisions. And for the large part, it's like people don't need, as much as I feel like they do sort of, you know, should should need an advisor, but they they don't. They cannot have that relationship. But typically it's those, the real estate agent, the mortgage broker, they're the ones that are, are, are all involved. People don't know. But uh, look, I could I could talk about that all day, but, uh, you know, we might end up in a rant fest and then. Might, you might get in hot water with your with your people, so so I'll uh, I'll steer away from that one. Mate, my last question for you um, yeah. is: what what are you what are you focused on? What's what's coming up for you? Uh, yeah, so I've got a, a, f- a few side hustles sort of going on at the moment, which is which is always good. I hate the term side hustle as well. I really wish I hadn't said that now. But I so in the background, it's always frustrated me. So I do ETFs, um, and I do ETFs quite well, but it's always frustrated me the access that you have to the managed fund space. So, for example, it's it's really difficult for you to buy a managed fund overseas. It's sort of a little bit of a pain for you to buy a managed fund here. You've got to go through a broker and uh, there's M funds. It's basically they've built, and this is me, I'm someone who builds brokers and builds back offices and builds these things. It's it's a difficult process to go through the situation in Australia to get a managed fund. It's impossible to buy a managed fund in India, for example. You can get an ETF, it doesn't have it. But if you want something that's specific, you can't do, you, you can't do it. So for the last couple of years, I've, I've tasked a group of guys, um, a couple of Ukrainian guys, actually, believe it or not, pre-war, obviously. Um, they were a little bit delayed because uh, one of them actually went to go and fight and protect his, his homeland, which is amazing. Um, but we built an app, we built a product that allows you to buy and sell managed funds around the world. You can buy and sell them just at the click of a button, deposit your money, buying it, buying it and selling it. And what we did, and this is really close to my heart because of how frustrating it was, you can now get access to a powerhouse like India through this method and nobody else can do this. So if you want to buy the Indian credit fund or the Matthews growth fund or something like that, the actual invest in that fund, you get access to it through this through this way of doing it into the Indian market. No one else can do it. No one else has done it. We built it um, and uh, I'm really proud of what we did. So this is sort of something that I've been beavering away at for the last few years and we've finally managed to get it done. It's called the Australian Mutual Funds Exchange, uh, shorten that to Amfex. Um, again, another name which I didn't get to decide, but there you go. But uh, the Australian Mutual Funds Exchange, so check it out, amfex.com. Um, you do a Google search, you're going to be able to find it. But that's what I'm working on. That's really close to my heart because it has been able to give retail investors the ability to get access to places they didn't have access to before and open up more markets to them, especially a powerhouse like India, which is getting all this amazing flow of people who are now moving, shifting their, their business from China. Um, you get access to somewhere like India, a powerhouse. We've just had our prime minister over there going around with Prime Minister Modi in a motorcade, shaking hands at the cricket, and everyone's fantastic. Their relationship has never been stronger, so we managed to build something that allows you to invest over there. I'm pretty, I'm really stoked about that. So Amfex, thank you for letting me just have a bit of a, a say about that. But it's good that in this industry, if you stay busy, you could build stuff on the side that will actually help people. I'm really proud that we managed to do that. Yeah, mate, it's awesome to see that access uh, increasing and and uh, getting easier, better information, better products. Uh, so so good to see, James. Thank mm. you so much for for taking the time. Re- really appreciate it. I'll let you go out there and uh, you know do some more deals and and get some more wins for the clients. But uh, mate, again, thank you for the time. No worries, Ben, mate. That was sensational. Always good to catch up. Look forward to the next one. <laughs>